Thank you, Dr. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the lung amyloidosis. Um, so I'm going to talk about the type of amyloid protein in general and what the effect on the lung with a couple of disease. It can affecting the lung and from the parenchyma and the from pleura and even the vascular in the uh, in general, uh, the amyloid, how it is started, it's misfolding of protein, and this protein is will be deposited on one of the organ, lead to malfunction of the organ, either the lung, liver, or any other organ in the body. And there is a lot of protein responsible for the amyloidosis. Uh, there are in general like 30 protein, but a few of them can affect the lung. And the most common of these, it's AL amyloid. It can be due to immunoglobin light chain. It can be systematic or localized due to lama immunoglobin or kappa. The other proteins is the trans amyloidosis is less common, and the secondary amyloidosis is also can affecting the lung. Distribution, it could be, as we say, systematic. Systematic is the producing of the amyloid protein. It's going to be outside the thoracics, and then it's going to be deposited inside the thoracics, including the lymph node, pleura, phrenic nerve, diaphragm, or the lung parenchyma itself, or the vascular structure. Localized, so the producing is going to be inside the thoracic cavity and to lead to the symptoms inside the lungs. And the most common of that is going to be like, uh, nodular causes of the lung. First, we're going to start with the diffuse parenchymal lung amyloidosis uh, to understanding that I have like a clinical case. So in this case, we have a 75 year old female who presented in 2017 with a progressive shortness of breath with minimal exertion, and she had past medical history significant for cystic uh, bolus disease of the lung, breast cancer, cyst post lumpectomy, and cervical cancer, cyst post hysterectomy, and she has smoking history. Uh, for that, they did a CT scan for her, a uh, CT scan showing a chronic appearing of non-specific diffuse interstitial opacity. As we see in the imaging, it's more interstitial thickening and with some consolidations. Uh, patient was referred to her, the pulmonary, the pulmonary decided to do a lung biopsy for her because of non-specific interstitial um, lung changes. Uh, as we see here, it's the hematoxylin iocene stain, which is showing the amorphous uh, amyloid deposit in the slide. Then here we have the congruent stains. Then here is under the polarized light is showing uh, green prefringes. And here they did the immunohistochemical for the kappa light chains. Uh, this lady, uh, she was diagnosed, as we said, with a diffuse parenchyma lung disease, secondary to AL amyloid uh, doses immunoallied chain. She received chemotherapy. After the chemotherapy, she improved and she went into just surveillance. So now we're going to talk about the diffuse parenchyma. Um, clinical feature, how the patient is presenting, usually with the exergen dyspnea, dyspnea and fatigue. And uh, most of these patients being well known to have uh, systemic amyloidosis, or it could be just undiagnosed and you're going to start diagnosis. Um, these patients usually, uh, they be in shortness of breath despite aggressive diuresis. Uh, you have to differentiate at this point between if the patient had cardiomyopathy, uh, cardiomyopathy due to the amyloidosis or the primary disease is affecting the lung. The imaging, uh, high resolution CT scan, uh, it can showing reticular, reticular nidrar, uh, or ground glass opacity, and uh, subpleural honey cumping pattern also can it present. Uh, usually, there is no specific uh, uh, signs on the CT scan for the amyloidosis itself. It can be just non specific, and you can differentiate it with other interstitial disease. This other imaging, this is the chest X-ray showing reticular nodular pattern and other part of the CT scan for that with the nodular pattern. Pulmonary function test, uh, it's typically uh, showing the restrictive lung physiology with decrease in the DLCO. Uh, diagnosis, as we said, if the patient is well known to have systemic uh, amyloidosis at this point, is the biopsy going to change the management or not? If it, you think the biopsy will change the management, we should go with the biopsy. If not, the biopsy then at this point is not necessary. 
but we have to differentiate, make sure that whatever we're showing in the CT scan with the interstitial thickening is not just pulmonary edema and volume of a lot. Um, if the patient was not diagnosed previously, at that point, you may start to diagnose systemic amyloidosis with if he has the other sinus symptoms of the other lung disease based on the proteinuria, macroglossia, and all these other symptoms. To take the, bio the diagnosis, we need a biopsy. The biopsy usually would go with the less invasive to most invasive. So use the simple part like abdominal fat or minus salivary gland. Then after that, we can do the lung biopsy if needed. Lung biopsy, it can be transbronchial biopsy. If it didn't give you the answer, uh, the other part, we're going to do surgical lung biopsy. After getting the biopsy, the, as we said, the hematoxenum is in a stain. Most important, showing the pink amorphous deposit of the amyloid in the slide and the congruent stain. And after that, the immunohistochemical staining to differentiate what the cause of the light change, if give Kaba or Lama. Management. Uh, again, it depends on the primary cause why they have the patient the amyloidosis. Is the secondary, primary, and uh, chemotherapy? It's part of the management of it was a secondary to AL uh, immunoglobulin light chain. Or uh, lung transplant is usually it's not an op option due to plasma cell uh, abnormalities. The other type is the nodular pulmonary amyloidosis. Um, again, we start with a very clinical case, 57-year-old uh, male patient who presented in March 2021 for routine physical exam uh, without pulmonary complaint. Because of prolonged history of smoking, they did just a surveillance screening lung uh, cancer CT scan, and they found a lung nodule 1.3 in the left uh, upper lobe and a small nodule in the right middle lobe. He went under PET scan. Uh, the SUV was 1.28, wasn't high. Then the patient um, referred to his pulmonologist, and they decided to go with. Uh, uh, so first of all, this is the scan. This is the long nodules here. So they decided the patient either CT guided lung biopsy or just removing the nodule. So they decided to remove the nodule, and the subsequent uh, pathology is showing. Amyloid, as we said, and hematoin is seen stain showing the amorphous uh, amyloid here and congruent stain, and here in the polarized uh, chain is the green preferences. Uh, so, a patient was uh, diagnosed with localized AL amyloid, and he went under surveillance CT scan, and there is draw recurrent of the disease. So nodular pulmonary amyloidosis is the most frequent uh, form of the pulmonary amyloidosis. Um, it's usually due to immunoglobin light chain uh, AL. Usually with the localized disease, the kappa is more than the lambda. And also the localized the nodular disease, it can be secondary to lymphoma as mild lymphoma. The imaging, the most important things here, uh, usually, uh, the nodule typically it's smooth, uh, lobular in contour, and sometimes can be speculated, but the speculated is more with the cancer um, nodules. The size between eight to three centimeter could be larger, uh, usually from the mid and lower zone. Uh, usually the nodule don't regress, but it's slowing growing. And usually if there is multiple nodules, there's going to be synchronous growth. And this is, can be differentiated if there is any cancerous nodules or different type of pathology is there. Calcification is part of it, but it's usually after five years, been there for a long time. Cavitary lesion, it's less likely, less than 10% of uh, these nodules can grow into cavities or the cyst, and uh, PET scan usually can differentiate between other uh, cancers or other pathology, but if the lymphoma is part of it, uh, it's going to be a PET positive. Uh, pulmonary function test, usually if the nodules number is uh, low, it's it not going to be showing any change in the pulmonary function test, but if there's like amorphous number of the nodules, the DLCO will decrease. Uh, diagnosis usually with a biopsy, as we said before, all the staining uh, can be applied and showing the amyloid. Management, uh, usually uh, there is no specific management as long as asymptomatic the patient and is not leading to any compressions to other structures. So it's usually just surveillance uh, just to make sure there is no abnormal nodules growing, uh, especially as we know, 
the synchronous growth should be between all the amyloids uh, nodules. But if we say one of the nodules, it's growing faster than the other, then it's uh, that's it be like red flagged for a biopsy that it could be a cancerous. Cystic uh, pulmonary nodules. Um, so how it is growing is usually it's to start as a nodules, but can obstruct the distal airway and it uh, developed as a ball valve mechanism and develop the cyst. Uh, clinical feature of it's uh, mainly affecting the female 62%, the median age 61 year. Uh, it can combine with the disease mild lymphoma, Sigourney syndrome. As we said, localized disease usually with a capillated change and the patient often asymptomatic with incidental just relatively abnormality finding. Uh, imaging, usually it's uh, the number is more than 10 cysts and usually it's uh, calcified small peripheral nodule. Uh, the size is less than one to two centimeter, but always can growing in size to be become larger. Uh, cysts are round or lobulated. Uh, pulmonary function test, usually there is no change in the PFT um, unless it become more in the size increase and increase in the residual volume, which lead to reduce the force particle capacity will lead to air trapping and restrictive spirometry features. Uh, differential diagnosis with other uh, cysts. Uh, there is multiple disease can affect, uh, make a cyst in the lung um, other than the amyloid. Uh, first thing is the lip, uh, lymphoid interstitial pneumonia. Uh, how we differentiate it, usually we come with a ground glass uh, opacity, which often present, not typically for the amyloidosis. And the number it will be fewer the number than the amyloidosis. Uh, LAM, lymphangiomatosis, um, really exhibit as an adduce as a characteristic. Uh, it's hard to see maybe here the picture, but the size it's small and irregular uh, comparing to the amyloid. Uh, here is pulmonary lung hand cell cytosis, uh, which may be going to be predominant in the upper lobes, um, comparing to amyloidosis, as we said, in the lower part. Then we have the PGP um, as an advanced disease. It can be developed as a, a cyst, uh, usually with septal thickening. And if we take a biopsy, uh, that then the silver stains different than the congruent stain, which we showing in the amyloidosis. DIP, uh, discriminative interstitial pneumonia, uh, usually with the underlying smoking and uh, also the ground glass appearance center. Uh, tracheobronchial amyloidosis um, is other form also of the lung amyloidosis. Other clinical uh, scenario, uh, patient 72 year old female who presented in November 2011, complaint persistent dry cough that started two years prior. This patient was seen by multiple specialists, including ENT, allergist, pulmonologist. Um, it's all been thinking uh, the suspicion of the etiol it will be multifactorial, possibly due to reactive airway disease or GERD. Uh, she underwent repeat CT scan in February 2014 that confirmed any change in the tracheal wall thickening she has. So this is the CT scan. Uh, this is 2011. So this is the trachea and the thickening on the, the wall. As we said, all the circumferential of the trachea uh, thickened. Usually, uh, the trachea as a, the normal is less than three millimeter as a thickness between one to three, but in this is going to be become over three, and all the circumference of the trachea will be increased in size. Then the patient, she's probably going to a bronchoscopy for further investigation. She had uh, a biopsy with the biopsy show predominant cap immunoglobulin light change with going with amyloid. Uh, her initial serum immunofixation show elevating the free capillary change and the normal free lamus change. And this is the histopathology showing again the hematoxylin stain stain with the amorphous um, amorphous deposit of the uh, amyloid here, the congruent stain here, the perfringes, the green apple. Uh, all over the patient went through the chemotherapy and multiple diagnoses. At the end, after receiving the chemotherapy, she was free of the disease and she getting surveillance uh, scan. 
Let's talk about the DC. The TPA is almost exclusively due to localized light chain amyloid depression. It could be with other uh, amyloid apolipoprotein, but more the common with the uh, uh, immunoglobulin light chain. Uh, clinical features, this patient can be with any age, including from childhood to older age. If it's in women, usually it come with a younger between 25 to 45, uh, men 50 to 70 year. Uh, symptoms predominantly is a cough, wheezing, dyspnea, hoarseness of voice, uh, hemoptysis, or exertion dyspnea. Uh, disease can be distributed either proximal airway uh, from the vocal cord to the um, main crina, or it can be the mid airway, distal trachea, till secondary crina, or just distal airway, uh, including distal to secondary crina. Uh, PFT, uh, if the disease uh, in the proximal disease, uh, we can see the flattening in the volume uh, lobe and all it can, uh, if it's the lesion is big enough to make obstruction, it can lead to airflow obstruction or air trapping. Uh, mid disease, uh, spirometry is usually normal or domestic obstruction airflow. Distal disease, uh, usually non-specific and can lead to air trapping with decrease the DLCO. Um, CT imaging um, in the proximal disease, as we said, uh, we can see the airway uh, lumen narrowing or increase the thickness of the trachea. And usually it's circumferential, so that's mean including even the posterior tracheal membrane, which can be differentiated with other disease can kind of affecting uh, the trachea and they increase the thickness. Uh, mid airway. As we said, it could be unilateral or bilateral, um, but usually the circumferential distal to the main crania. And airway calcification also it can be found, but if the calcification happened, it's usually above the amyloid deposition and it not will be exclusive to the cartilage. No, it's going to be whole the trachea. This is a CT scan finding. Uh, this one here is with a a trachea itself, all the trachea itself, and here with a right main bronchus, mainly with a calcification. Uh, flexible bronchoscopy, uh, it's after the we suspected on the CT imaging, patient go the flexible bronchoscopy and the biopsy, uh, showing it can be focal rays, heart, edge, yellow deposit. Uh, concentric infiltrate with subucosal disease inflammatory surface. Uh, it can be nodular also and capillary prominence and erythematous base. Here's some um, indoors um, bronchoscopy imaging. And here the other scan showing the thickness here in the right male bronchus, uh, sorry, left male bronchus and how is the nodular edge here. Uh, diagnosis, as we said, biopsy, and uh, this is the main things. Uh, before that, imaging, including CT scan, with give the suspicion, then you go to the biopsy. Differential diagnosis, um, here the relapsing polychondritis, usually diffuse thickening, but the posterior membrane usually is going to be spared. In the amyloidosis, diffuse thickening, but the posterior membrane is not spared, so it's whole circumferential. The TPO is the uh, tracheopathia osteochondroplastasia. It's uh, I, I first time here with this disease. Uh, osteocartitis nodules also, and posterior membrane also spared in this disease, and GPA, Wigner disease. Uh, posterior membrane at that time is not uh, spared. It's, it's going to be nodular and smooth thickness. Uh, management, it depends on the location and how the system, if the patient is symptomatic, it not bother him. So basically there is no <clears throat> second step to do and uh, we don't have to treat it. If the patient has the hoarseness of voice, usually due to deep assault of the amyloid, either in the through the vocal cord or the fold or in the subglottic area, usually it's ENT, manage this and usually with a laser or remove it. If the patient complain from a shortness of breath, hemoptysis, now it's under us. Uh, if it's something it's acute, as we said yesterday, the hemoptysis or the shortness of breath, we try to open the airway or secure it and treat the hemoptysis. But usually if the circumferential airway wall thickening, uh, it could be a laser treatment. Um, 
Aggressive debulking is not recommended because it can lead to fibrotic response and resulting in the airway stenosis and the worsening situation. Balloon dilatation is part of uh, the treatment. Airway stenting, it could be, but usually they more recommend with the silicon stent because uncover or partial cover strain can lead to overgrowth of this amyloid inside the stent and lead to block it. A steroid or mitomycin injection also has been studied uh, to be injected. Uh, plural disease, uh, persistent plural. If you, so if you go back to the picture, uh, pictures, which one? That? So the symptoms are because of airway narrowing. Is that why they have symptoms? Yeah, that's what, from my understanding. Um, I think I had one more picture too. So uh, yeah, go back. Mm -hmm. So I mean, like the pictures at the bottom. Which I mean, one, C or D? C and D. Yeah. I mean, I see airway involvement, but it, I was not expecting that it would cause the. Uh, no, I mean, the, so if the patient comes in with symptoms and I have this, what, like, what would you do? You know I'm saying? If the patient is symptomatic, you don't have to do anything. Yes, symptomatic. Symptomatic. So he has symptom and like this kind of airway. with symptoms, and then they have this airway, and you biopsy them as amyloid. Mm -hmm. And like, there's nothing to debulk here or open, or everything is open. Can they have cough without airway obstruction, or does it have to be, or is there symptoms mostly because of mechanical obstruction? And the airway, like for example, A and B, obviously you can see a lot of uh, narrowing there and inflammation. Right. I mean, if there is narrowing and inflammation, there is like the, the saying you can do the laser treatment or like ballooning. If the narrowing itself, it can affect the if it's if it become symptomatic from this narrowing. But if you don't expect the narrowing is the cause of symptoms, maybe something else going. On. But I mean, with this imaging and. To be honest, the CND, I don't believe it's going to be it's a symptom. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's just hard to tell. When I see a patient come to me saying, I'm sure about that coughing, I see this airway uh -huh. and the amyloid, but I'm like, is this, uh, what do I do now? Be something different. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's something else, but. Uh, because, like, like, you mean, like, it has, like, he might have amyloid affecting the brain, camera, is that right? It's not just like the airway. If you if you go inside with the bronchoscopy and you, you find that your airway is gone. Yeah. Well, I mean the CT scan. I mean if there is diffuse parenchymal involvement, or the endure is going to be showing the CT scan. Which it doesn't have to be like severely to have symptoms. Like you don't have to see a severe diffuse uh, um, uh, oh, to start having symptoms. Right. Like it can be mild like changes in the CT scan, and then a patient who has like an enlistment mm -hmm. patient who doesn't do a lot of like activity, and mm -hmm. that will be like that push him to the limit that he will have symptoms. Right. And you go in and you find like airways completely open mm -hmm. and you do a biopsy and it comes back, it's amyloid. Yeah, I mean, if the airway is completely open, there's nothing to open, right? But it's yeah, open already. So, but, but I mean, I understand your question. I mean, it's, question is, uh, and I don't know, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. If uh, they have symptoms, but their airway looks like this. What's the next step? Then there's not, then I, I can, can I say comfortably that this is not causing your symptoms? Or is, is airway involvement, even though it's not causing obstruction, can cause maybe a more of a reactive airway kind of picture? And is it related because to I think when you have a myelodosis, the mm -hmm. other thing that you have to make, well, in, in this patient, if I go in and I find like it's normal airway. You want to make sure it's not systemic disease. And and no, I didn't like for the, I mean, you're, you're right. But like, let's say the scenario is uh -huh. me, I have a mild, oh, I don't, I don't know how I have a myelodosis. I came with a shortness of breath. You did a CT scan, there is mild changes in the CT scan, maybe suggestive of myelodosis. I have symptoms. If you look at my bron bronchoscopy, there's no, there's an area of erythema, a little bit. Mm -hmm. You did like biopsy, it came back, it's amyloid tissue positive, like for amyloid. Mm -hmm. Okay, the congruent same with yep, negative, yep. I'm positive, I mean, whatever it was positive for amyloid. And I have symptoms, mm -hmm. and my airway is open now in the test, test, test. Sure. So, what's the next step from this? Like you have parenchymal disease? A little bit of parenchymal disease. Yeah, so we'll treat. I, I'm going to look for other, I mean, it could be a complication. Good, so you will, like, like, will exclude, so you need to have a PFT and all the stuff to make sure yes. that's like an yeah, hyper, hyper, hyper way. And the other thing that amyloidosis can lead to trachymalacia, is that right? Mm -hmm. Can lead to severe ADAC. So you have to have a, a conscious bronchoscopy as well okay. to exclude that as well. Mm -hmm. Because some of the patients that they end with severe, inflammation of the uh, airway of the cartilage and usually 
it, it can be posterior tracheomalacia, but it can be even anterior tracheomalacia in the cartilage itself. Mm -hmm. And that lead, and without ne with negative CT scan, you will not say, see that the changes in the thickness and anything like that. And those patients might end up with like needing a temporary stent to see if that will improve their symptoms. And it reached a point that you put the stent on and there's no improvement in the symptoms. Then you know, like, yes, they have tracheomalacia, but it's not the main reason of their symptoms and then you go from there like oh there's something else going on again i mean the diffuse disease like in the amyloidosis it could be it's just hard to sit yeah I mean, systematic disease like air i mean assuming like monoclonal angers the multiple myeloma is going to go on this stuff so you have to treat the primary disease itself even if it's just only in the tracheal bronchial amyloidosis yeah, yeah. but like you're right but the i understand is, i understand yeah, your question i understand the open airway okay so if you're telling me that uh, if there's tracheal involvement, there should be symptoms if there is airway obstruction, technically, right? I can't say so repeat this thing. If there is <laughs> tracheal involvement, uh -huh. the patient should only develop symptoms if there is airway obstruction. Or there is well again we saw like there is a three stages it can be proximal mid or distal i mean the distal part below the secondary carina you can't really see it 100 percent with the bronchoscopy so it could be there is obstruction and at that time you're going to see some pft changes with more restrictive disease and decrease the dlc or because you're going to decrease your fvc if you can't see it how can you treat it because you said the treatment is mostly mechanical right it's right okay. that's if there is like obstruction it could be systemic disease again if there is like a primary amyloidosis it's not systemic and it's in the distal and you cannot see it because the treatment because it's hard going to be just deposited in the distal without a cause why so why there is deposit in the amyloidosis as we said like there is a primary cause for it like either the AL immunoglobulin light change so we have to treat the cause okay. that's from my understanding hey, 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 hey minus it's part of Systemic disease. Yes, it's part yeah, of yeah. systemic disease. Even it can be localized, but even the localized disease, uh, it's gonna be the production of the amyloid inside the thorax. It could be multi, like lymphoma. Second, something else has been or like the primary. Yeah. So here the pleural disease, uh, pleural disease, and um, it can be persistent pleural effusion. Uh, it could be for two causes. And the first, of course, it could be just um, a heart failure, amyloidosis congestive heart failure, which is going to be um, response to diuretics most of the time. But if the amyloidosis itself uh, due to deposition on the parietal pleura at that time, it's going to be become resistant to uh, diuretics. Uh, there is no specific uh, test to diagnose in the fluid. Uh, fluid 37 of percent is going to be exudative, but most of the time it's going to be transudative. Uh, imaging, chest X-ray, all the stuff, just uh, ultrasound to confirm it, and the uh, real diagnosis is going to be with uh, biopsy from the parietal pleural uh, biopsy, where we're saying the pleural amyloid deposition. Uh, management, um, diuretics, even. Uh, with the resistant diuretics, it should be used to decrease the frequency of reaccumulating of the fluid. Uh, large volume uh, fluorocentesis or pleurax catheter, enduring catheter insertion, and the pleurodesis also was studied to be inserted to decrease the frequencies. Uh, this thing here about the prognosis, if it's been found uh, PPE, the persistent pleural effusion, it's going to be with a bad prognosis. Uh, pulmonary vascular disease, uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, either where it's uh, coming from, either group two, three, one, or five. If there's secondary to congestive heart failure, it's going to be group two. Uh, as we said, if due to diffuse uh, parenchymal amyloidosis will be under group three, our direct deposition in the pulmonary artery will be under group one, or it's going to be under connective tissue disease in group five due to familiar Mediterranean uh, fever. Lymphadenopathy is the rare manifestation of the amyloidosis. Um, usually also it's going to be under the systemic uh, disease, uh, immunoglobin light change. Diagnosis usually with the EBUS um, after the biopsy, the same uh, morphology we saw before with amorphous deposit and uh, congruent stain. Um, you should always evaluate for systemic amyloidosis uh, because it's really to be just um, it can by itself just lymphadenopathy. Uh, treatment, if it's just only lymphadenopathy, usually you don't have to treat unless there's a 
symptoms due to impinging on the other structure from the increasing the size of the lymphadenopathy. Last uh, part of it is the diaphragm dysfunction. Uh, it can be secondary to amyloid deposit in the diaphragm muscle itself or due to mononeuritis multiplex uh, involving the phrenic nerve or the phrenic nerve damage due to impingement from the amyloid lymphadenopathy. Uh, usually here, uh, the patient either become asymptomatic or become uh, symptomatic with a dyspnea on exertion or they have orthopnea when they are flat. Um, a treatment uh, usually treat the primary cause, um, the plasma cell abnormality or um, a supportive treatment with non-invasive. And uh, that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. 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 So, do you talk about like systemic treatment? Like, if, if the patient has a mild, I can't late. Sorry. Yeah, the chemo. Uh, I so just briefly about it. Uh, but again, the as you said, the systemic disease, uh, the primary disease, if it's again due to plasma cell dysplasia, chemotherapy, it can be part of it. But they're saying if it's diffuse uh, amyloidosis, it's going to be less 